Good morning. Yes, I think that was a very nice uh, that, was a, that was a very nice presentation. I'm afraid mine is not going to be as uh, as colorful and as fancy. Um, so my name is Eshban Kwesiga from Parliament Watch Uganda. Um, what we do at Parliament Watch is simple. I mean, we like to tell people that our work essentially involves bridging the gap between Parliament and the people. Um, when we started out in 2013, um, we had an idea. Essentially, Facebook and Twitter had become a big deal in Uganda, and uh, there, were, there were a lot of political discourse and political conversations happening on those platforms. Uh, the election, the presidential elections that had happened two years before had also told us that really those two platforms, Facebook and Twitter, were going to be uh, where most of the political discussions were going to happen. But in 2013, um, there wasn't a lot of information coming out of Parliament, and I hope that most of you would agree that a lot of political discussions are really generated by the content that comes out of Parliament. So um, we took a phone, a smartphone, and uh, went inside Parliament, and we started to live tweet what was happening in parliamentary committee meetings. So essentially, it looked like this. Um, so at any given time, we have about eight people who will sit in committee meetings and they will live tweet discussions that are happening um, in committee meetings and in plenary. Now, um, what we didn't expect was that the online community that had, I think, for a very long time, been just that had been discussing what we, you know, consider like trivial issues, uh, took a very keen interest in it because. Uh, as it turns out, a lot of the discussions in Parliament also have some relevancy to mainstream audiences. Uh, so this, this was something last week. Uh, they were discussing the sexual offences bill. So if you, if you follow us on Twitter, you'll keep getting live minute-by-the-minute -minute updates of what MPs are saying. But um, so since then, our, in a space of about four years, our users have grown from zero to 114,000. And that is uh, maybe about 50,000 on Twitter, 20,000 on Facebook, and the others that visit our, that use our newsletters and visit our websites. So what we didn't anticipate going into this was that we would become the source for information on Parliament. Um, this graph here shows that, uh, so we've been tracking uh, organizations and individuals that come to us for this information, and it shows that civil society ranks number one followed by the Parliament of Uganda, which was ironic for us because we got the information from them, uh, followed by uh, members of the mainstream press and embassies, law firms, students. So almost without planning it, we became this central repository of you know, the place that you go to to get to access information of what's happening in Parliament. So our, start, our work started to evolve a little bit from just being people that provide information to, oh, that came too soon, uh, being people that provide information to doing, um, to doing a lot more. So, so we decided, look, our work is not just going to be to provide information. I think let us start bridging the gap between parliament and the people. At that time, there were very, very few members of parliament on Twitter or Facebook. So we launched a campaign or training to encourage them to join Facebook and Twitter because it became obvious to us that people were interested in what MPs were saying they are interested in information coming out of parliament, but there was no way to access it. Now the institution that was parliament, the institution that is parliament was not so forthcoming, so what we did was we worked with individual members of parliament. And this is what happened. Um, so this, so, so, so the graph in blue shows um, what it looked like before we started conducting the trainings. I don't know if you guys can, yeah. So the, so, so the blue, the, the bars in blue looks like, uh, shows what it looks like before we started conducting the trainings. And um, so th the first set, those were the number of tweets. And when we conducted the trainings, there was a 25 increment in the number of tweets going, up, going out from members of parliament. So obviously we need to do more, you know, uh, teaching them or training them how to tweet more. Um, then we also need to do more on the number of people that they follow but what impressed us was the number of people that followed them. So, um, I mean, for a long time, um, people had already said discussions on parliament and what our MPs are up to is something that is only of interest to civil society, political players, and academia, you know, that small circle. But the number of, uh, the, the number of followers that MPs were able to get indicated to us that 
there was some mainstream interest and demand of what MPs were saying and what their ideas were. So in 2016, after, uh, after the general election, we put together a list of the new members of parliament, and this is what it looked like. Uh, if it gives you a little headache, you should know it, 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 it gave us headache as well. So um, because we had decided that our work was going to be to present parliament to the people, we had no idea what to do with this. We spent some time thinking about it. And 2016, it became obvious to us that, we, that, that it was important to just change how we do. So this is generally a list of members of parliament, their constituencies, uh, their districts, their political parties. It also included uh, gender and their phone numbers. And we came up with something like this. So this is basically the same content that I just showed you, but in a more graphical, in a more graphical form. And when we put this out, um, the feedback that we got was incredible. As in, this simple graph alone made our followers, our followers spiked by about 10% in a very short time. So it became obvious to us that, you know, we couldn't just be the people that were just putting out information the way, you know, it was or the way we had received it. We wouldn't just scan a document and upload it on our website. It was important to visualize the information and also interpret it as well. Um, so this shows a graph of, uh, this shows a pictorial representation of the political parties in Uganda. As you can see, one of them has close to 72% of the entire house. So that makes it very easy for them to pass legislation. But looking at the information like this also helped us understand some of the decisions that parliament had made in the past that nobody had a clear explanation to, or some of the, some of, some of the ways that our parliament had acted that, um, that uh, some of the ways our parliament had acted for which there was very limited analysis. So when we looked at the gender representation in parliament, it helped us understand a lot of the laws, especially laws that affect women, how they had been passed or, or, why long it, uh, or how long it took specific laws to be passed. So we essentially moved from we are the guys who provide information, uh, here I have it, to we are the guys who look at the information, break it down, present it in a pictorial uh, form, and then provide analysis for it. So this graph alone helped us understand um, some of the laws, uh, especially the laws that affect women and why they have been passed the way they are. An example would be, so for about nine years now, there's been a proposed law to criminalize marital rape in Uganda. Um, the average time it takes to pass a political bill in Kampala or in Uganda is about two months. Um, I do, uh, we recently had our president pass a law to remove the, to remove the presidential age limit. It took them less than 60, it took them about 50 days to do it. A single, a simple law that, that, that criminalizes a thing like marital rape has taken nine years. And part of that is because of the, of the way that the, the gender ratio is really set up um, in parliament. <clears throat> Sorry. And part of that is really because of the way the gender ratio is really set up in parliament and a, cost of, a cocktail of other reasons. So we've now moved from information to analysis. Um, but we find that the more we look at information coming out of parliament and the more we go through, we dig, we dig through layers of, 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 what's, of, of what's in our parliament, it helps, us, it helps us and political players within Kampala civil society organizations to understand how to go about the how to, to understand how to go about the work that they do. So for a long, for so for a very long time, um, people in Uganda had said that Uganda passes poor laws because our parliament is not educated enough. Uh, the basic minimum to become a member of parliament in Uganda is to have a well, what I think in the in the UK would probably be an A level certificate. So, but when we looked at the numbers and when we, so this is basically us essentially getting a list of MPs and looking at their qualifications, looking at their political affiliations and coming up with things like this, we learned that the Ugandan parliament is very, very educated. And uh, for, for a very long time, civil society had, you know, proposed solutions with the idea that you're dealing with a very uneducated bunch. So from that, we've, so we've moved to just analysis to now being able to provide information that not only informs our work, but informs generally the, the you know, development organizations and civil society in Uganda as a whole. Um, so still on marital rape. So for some time, uh, so for so for some time, uh, so for so for the time for the time that we spent having the discussion on marital rape, um, a lot of people said, uh, you know, it's in the next parliament, it's going to get better. 
uh, because if because we have the number, the, the ratio of men to women is is equalizing. This shows um, how that has progressed since 1989 to 2011, um, and. Going by that sequence, for those of you who just remember like elementary math, it showed that it would take maybe about 15 years until the time of, it will take at least 15 years for the number of women and men in the Ugandan parliament to be equal. So it might take roughly 15 years for them to pass legislation on marital rape. That's just my speculation. So, um, but the longer that we've spent in parliament, we, uh, we, we are consistently, you know, un, un, or like unearthing or uncovering information that we find is very, very exciting, especially to the press and to mainstream audiences. So we started looking at the budget. Uh, for a very long time, uh, the Ugandan press um, had covered the budget, but there are so many things that they never covered. So if you dig through layers and layers of pamphlets and books and papers, you'll find something they, that we refer to as the unfunded priorities. So these are things that are important, but there's no money. At least that's what the government says. I don't know if this is clear to the people at the back, but one of them is ARVs, drugs for HIV AIDS, um, recruitment of health workers, construction of a radiotherapy bunker for cancer. So um, for, for a long time, the press us uh, ourselves included, had covered, uh, parla had covered the budget, but we had only gone as far as saying, Yo, this is the national budget, this is how much is going to health, this is how much is going to education. But this information allowed us to you know, generate a national conversation on this thing that they call unfunded priorities. They say it's important, but then they say, you know, they will, but then they say that they will not provide money for it. And the work that we've been doing at Parliament Watch is to dig through tons and tons of paperwork and find information like this uh, to put it out there. So um, this was uh, information that we found on who owns the capital, who owns the health facilities in Kampala. The Ugandan government spends a lot of money on health. Um, I think for a very long time. It was understood that also that this money is also spent within the capital city. Uh, Kampala is the capital city of Uganda, for, for those that might not know. Uh, for a very long time, there was an assumption that this money is also spent within the city. So this graph shows that this money actually wasn't, uh, contrary to uh, the public narrative and the government narrative, as well as the conversations happening in parliament, that a lot of money in the health sector was being spent on health facilities in the city. Uh, Kampala has a population of about 4 million by day, and um, it's, one of those, it's one of the places that really gets the least funding as far as the health sector goes. Um, this was information that we uncovered uh, for the education sector. So at Parliament Watch, our business is to present, want to present information, but also information that is driven at keeping government honest and preventing false narratives, opening up the data that government has, but we are also not shy you know, to publish information that, is, that makes the government look good as long as it's true. So uh, for, for, a long time, there was, uh, for a long time, there was a narrative that government wasn't spending enough on education. And what we did was we pulled up this data that showed that over the years 2013, now you have to look at the pencil, 2013, 14, 15, government spending on education had been increasing. And we keep telling uh, our development partners, parliament as well, that uh, we are not in the business of bashing government. We are in the business of opening up government data and, pro and providing government information, regardless of whether it makes you look good or bad. Um, you remember this? So this was the train, uh, 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 these were the results from the training that we did with, with members of parliament, like I said, specifically because we are really keen on opening up parliament, not just making the data accessible, but to making members of parliament accessible as well. In Uganda, most of the places you'd meet your member of parliament would be at a wedding, at a funeral. If you're lucky, you might see him in traffic jam. The institution that is parliament is so, so difficult to access, and yet it's essentially a public building. I mean, you'd really need to be an insider to know how to like, access the building or even access the office where your member of parliament sits. Uh, so we got the deputy speaker on, on Twitter, as, as well as the speaker of parliament, and we encouraged them. We now do quarterly, or, or, and, uh, quarterly and maybe, depending on their schedule, uh, once every two months, occasional tweet chats to just talk about things that are happening in government, things that are happening in parliament. And 
we, we spend at least two weeks promoting it so that anyone that's on Twitter or Facebook knows that on such and such a day, this MP is going to be available. And there's a hashtag for anyone to follow questions. So if an MP, or, 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 or if, if, if an MP decides to dodge a question or to you know, sidestep it, there are always ways to remind them, oh, you know, there's, a, there's, there's this question right here that we think we should respond to. And it has had, this has really been one of our most successful things in the recent past, so much so that the Parliament of Uganda uh, decided to adopt it, uh, uh, to, to decided to take it up as one of their projects. Um, but like I said, our work keeps evolving and evolving from just being the guys that provide information to being the people that provide analysis to being the people that you know, make MPs more accessible. We're now using more, more technological tools to get mainstream audiences more involved in, in, in parliamentary business. This was a project that we worked on that we, named, that we dubbed um, Make Your Budget. Essentially, what we did was show what the national budget looks like. Then we developed a tool. Um, I didn't put the link. Then we developed a tool that allows you to go to our website and look and do your own budget, you know, come up with your own budget, give us an idea of if you're in charge of making this budget, what would it look like? And we've had close to 3,000 people within the city participate in this campaign, and it has, uh, it, it, it has revealed to us some interesting dynamics. Uh, for example, we now know that at least most people that use our platform will spend the same amount on security and defense as the government does. Uh, which is ironic because there's a lot of public criticism on how much government spends on security and defense. So we think that the work that we are doing has been very key in you know, just debunking some of the narratives that have gone on for a long time, but uh, that have gone on for a long time, unchallenged, and also some of the narratives that are false to just help us have more honest discussions on, on, uh, on, how, to conduct, on how to conduct business in parliament. So, um, we do a lot, but I'm running out of time. So, essentially, thank you.